stand in your very presence, acknowledging you, acknowledging, Lord, your very presence, your Lordship. For, Lord, you've said in your word that if we lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, that all men will be drawn to you. And, Lord, this morning we lift up Jesus. We lift up, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, as Moses lifted up the serpent and the rod and all that looked were delivered, so Jesus became the curse, became sin in our stead. He died in our place that through him we might receive of life eternal. And Lord, this morning we thank you for the shed blood of Calvary's cross, for redemption freely given. Lord, we thank you for the regenerating power of your Holy Spirit, wherein, Lord, we have been regenerated and made a new creation, a new man, a corporate man in the earth, a body, a many-membered body. And, oh, Lord, we thank you that we may be members of that body set in by the Holy Spirit in a particular place that we might function together as a whole, and this morning, Lord, we lift up grateful hearts for that redemption that you have wrought within and upon your people in this hour and in this day. And Lord, those of us that are not feeling well, for Lord, as in the physical body, when any one member hurts, the whole body is disturbed. And so, Lord, we thank you. And we would impart a healing, a strengthening. Lord, every burden, Hallelujah, every need, every perplexity, every disturbance, we bring before you, Lord, of this body, asking, Lord, a sovereign working of your grace and your love and your power in healing and deliverance and setting free. Now, Lord, in the authority of your word, we speak a creative word, pushing back principality, power, every spirit, every hindrance, be removed from this people. Hallelujah. Liberating and setting free your people, Lord. Hallelujah. For your purpose and for your glory, we speak a word of deliverance. Lord, we push back principality and power and we clear in prophetic vision, we clear the atmosphere over this place, this meeting, this campus, Lord, that the sun, hallelujah, Lord, you've risen on high. Your raiment did shine as the sun, Lord. Glory, and Lord, we long for the warmth of that radiance, of that light that you may shine upon us, Lord, in an open heaven, an open vision. Lord, cause us to become truly a prophetic people that we may enter into the kingdom, into that realm and dimension of your life and your spirit. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless you, Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Hallelujah. Oh, 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 Glory. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, in the time that we have together, that we may be edified, built up, and strengthened in the faith. 
in the working of your power, your spirit, your life. We thank you, Lord, and we glorify your name through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Yeah, turn. You turn. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> See? Oops. <laughs> okay. It seems for the for the last couple of weeks, I've been having a problem with a sore neck. And it really is disturbing. It's amazing how a little little pain in the neck <laughs> literally can be disturbing. But I've been thinking some about it. We're the body. Jesus, the Christ, the Lord, he's the head. You know, it's interesting that, that Jesus is to be seen in our life. The body, amongst Christians, we teach holiness of the bodies to be covered, properly dressed, that the head might be seen. You know, when, when rebellion comes in, the first thing people do is start to take their clothes off. That's a mark of rebellion. For the body is to be covered, the head's to be seen. Meaning that we're to recognize the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the neck connects the head and the body. And I wonder if my pain in the neck is prophetic. <laughs> the Lord is saying he has a problem with a connection between the body and the head. <laughs> Amen. And it really is disturbing, it's amazing the problem it can cause. It really bothers me. And actually it makes me edgy because it's just, it's just there and I, I'm not quite sure what to do about it. But I was wondering if it might be prophetic. <laughs> Amen. That the Lord is concerned about the connection between the body and the head. That we're truly relating to the head. Amen. I, I, I feel someone's said to us sometime as Pinecrest a sonship school. I'm not quite sure what that word means, sonship. And, but it means a lot of different things. Some, it, it, it's a word that's been basically ruled by a lot of way out in doctrines. So if someone asks me if we're a sonship school, I don't hesitate anymore. I answer it right away. I say no. <laughs> we're not. We're, we're, we're not. Sonship relates to something that a person, you know, if I, I'm, I'm, I'm a son, see. Sonship relates to me. Well, we're to relate to the Lord. So we're not a sonship school. We're not interested in ourselves and our position. We're interested in the Lord. But I believe we are a kingdom school. We're a school of the kingdom, and I believe this is the message that the Lord's given us, a kingdom message. And by kingdom, I mean this. There's two basic realms in, in Christianity. The realm of salvation. Salvation means that I have Jesus. I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm filled with the Spirit, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> See, it's all the benefits that I have through Calvary's cross. I've gained a lot. I've gained eternal life, inner peace, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, ministry, gifts. The Lord's done a lot for me. He's blessed me beyond my imagination. I owned a TV cable system once, and the fellow that I sold it to laughed at me when I left. And I was kind of nervous. I, it was a good business. In fact, he has it for sale today. If you'd like to buy a cable system, I can give you the address. He'd like to sell it. The price is $2 million. <laughs> $2.5 million, I think. He's asking for it, and he's a millionaire a couple times over. So I owned it, and I sold it. Walk, I walked out into nothing. Absolutely nothing. I thought maybe I might be able to pastor a little church someplace. Out in maybe I just had a picture of a little place out in the woods. I never imagined anything like this. And I know on July the 4th, 1959, I was driving towards Philadelphia and I was going to pioneer a church. I was going to start a church on Stenton Avenue in North Central Philly. And the Lord stopped me. I'd say audibly spoke to me and told me to come to Pinecrest had been purchased by the Italian branch of the Assemblies of God and I came up here and the Lord spoke. And I could probably write a book on how I got from there to here that would read like the book of Acts, absolutely profound. But you see, we can't outgive the Lord. And I was going to pioneer a church because I feel very limited. I feel, and I felt, I really felt this, this is honest. I felt that I'm so limited that it would be wrong of me to impose myself on people. 
on a congregation. But I thought if I pioneer a church and anyone comes, then it's their fault and not mine. <laughs> and I'm free. <laughs> so I was going to pioneer a church. So no one could say I was imposing myself on them. <laughs> and the Lord turned me around and sent me here. And I marvel at what he's done. You cannot outgive the Lord. You see, all that he's given, he's given all this. But there's something more. See, salvation, redemption, the infilling of the Spirit, gifts, prophecy, gifts of healing. I'm healed. I've been tremendously healed. I walked into a service in absolute agony on a pair of crutches one time. In pain, I fell through a ceiling 12 feet and landed on my back on a concrete floor and spent a week in the hospital and walked out on a pair of crutches in absolute intense agony and I saw physically a ball of fire about this big move from the back of the room towards me and burn itself right through me and I walked out with the crutches. See, I've been healed. I mean profoundly healed. See, I have received all this. That's salvation. The, the redemption Jesus gave. A total giving that we might receive. But there's something more now. Now that I've received all this, I can say thank you and go on my way and get richer and richer and I'll get richer and blessed and because if you're a Christian you'll live better, there's stewardship and you'll be richer. But the Lord is looking for a people that will take all of that plus that which I gained in the Garden of Eden, the right to myself, see, the knowledge of good and evil where I can choose for myself, I don't need God. See, I gained that in the Garden of Eden the freedom to do what I want to do, to choose for myself. I can take that, which is the most profound thing I can do, is give that back to the Lord and make him Lord. See, I can take all that he's given me through redemption and I can give it all back to him, plus me. Say, now Lord, I'm taking all that you've given and I'm giving it back. And I'm placing myself under your government, your headship, to be what you would have me to be. That's the kingdom. See, where he's Lord. When I say Lord Jesus Christ, Christ means the anointed, the blessed. We are anointed. We're blessed. Jesus, that's salvation, redemption. He gave and he's yet giving. Lord, that means he's Lord of my life, personalized. He has become my Lord and my life is in submission to his government, to his headship. And I come under that. Salvation, I have Jesus. The kingdom, Jesus has me. See, a lot of people have Jesus, but Jesus has very few people. There's very few that will take all that they have received and submit it, I mean submit it, back to him and come under the law of the kingdom, the government, and begin to walk out their life in the spirit in obedience to his word. And so we're a kingdom school in the sense that we're learning how to walk in the spirit, how to walk out our life under his government, his headship, to submit to his government. And the Lord is doing something profound and special. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Again, I want to welcome the visitors, those that are here for the first time. Trust you're getting to find your way around. And the place looks big at first, but it's really too small. <laughs> and trust that somehow you're, you're feeling at home. And this is our 17th year and we started with absolutely nothing and just some buildings that were empty for six years. I mean absolutely vacant and vacated and came in and started up from, from nothing. But back in 1959 I was here as a student when the Italian Assemblies of God had control of the property and up on the top floor I was in a little room praying and I was literally caught up into visible glory. I was scared out of my wits but the Lord spoke to me that he brought me here to train a people in this realm that I'm talking about, in the realm of the Spirit, in the Kingdom and to prepare a people and this has been centering in and I'll share a little more about this Lord willing tomorrow morning. John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And I feel this is what the Lord's after in our day. I don't mean to take Brother Wilbur's time. But, but see, John came on the scene at a very critical time in history, at the closing out 
of an age where people had failed God, utterly failed God, and now there was the birthing of something completely new, a new covenant, something better. And in that transition, there was a voice, there was a, a, an instrument that was available, and at that time the Lord wanted to weep. He wept. You know, there are those today that are laughing over the wreckage of, of lives and groups and ministries. But the Lord was weeping over the, over the wreckage of Israel. It was closed, Israel was being closed out to come to judgment and to be scattered amongst the nations. And they, would, they, 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 they would crucify the very Son of God and be rejected by God and scattered. And God wept over it. He didn't rejoice, he wept. John was the voice of one See, the voice of one. He was a vessel, an instrument that was available for what God wanted to do at that particular time. He wanted to weep over Israel. And there was a vessel that was available through whom he could weep. That's a profound thing. I believe the Lord wants to do certain things or say certain things towards humanity, towards nations in our day. And he's looking for a vessel or an instrument, hallelujah, that would be available in the right place at the right time through whom the Lord could speak or reveal himself in a unique way to a people. And I believe Pinecrest is called to prepare, as it were, John the Baptists, plural. I don't know how to say that, plural. But, but in, and I don't mean in some special sense of of, of identity as some great person, but I mean as a vessel or an instrument that's available for the Lord to do and be what he wants to do and be in a unique way. That the Lord is looking for vessels. He may only want to weep through them. He may want to laugh, cry. He may want to speak. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. That we're available, that's all. You know, it's nice to know. Sometimes people say, well, it's nice to have a couple hundred dollars set aside just in case. There's, you know, you, you may never use it, but there's a security because it's there. You know it's there just in case. And it brings sort of a, a, a security to, uh, in the human sense. And for the Lord to know that he has somebody that's available should he want to speak, that he can trust, that he can do what he would want to do through that person, that's a profound thing. And I believe the Lord is preparing vessels and instruments in that sense in our day. He's looking for a people, not theologians or some great ministry or prophet or apostle. I think it just a John the Baptist, an instrument, a vessel in the right place at the right time through whom the Lord can do what he would do. If John's, Jesus said this, that there's none greater born of women than John the Baptist. And I believe the reason that Jesus said that about John was this. John made one of the most profound statements that could ever be made. For all Israel went out into the wilderness to see John. The world, you might say the world at that time was following John. And John, Jesus came on the scene and John made the most profound statement that could ever be made. He said this, he must increase, but I must what? Decrease. That is profound. See, that he, that he got out of the way that Jesus could be seen. Amen. Glory. He became a vessel and instrument through which the Lord could be revealed. Sonship, that's an emphasis. I'm a son. I'm a, I, I. And I believe the Lord has literally wiped out that kind of a concept amongst his people. He's come against it. We're not that by the grace of God. But a kingdom people that are available to the Lord, to his headship, to his government, that can be a, an instrument or a channel for that which he would do in the way that he would do it. And if we're that, then we have succeeded tremendously. We have succeeded. Not in something that we've done, in something that we've become. Available to the Lord. Hallelujah. And available people to the Lord that can hear, that can be what he would have us to be. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So again, I want to welcome you to Pinecrest. Thank you. And where's all our song leaders? We're going to sing a chorus, and then Brother Wilbur's going to come and share the word. <laughs> Mom, both of you. <laughs> all right, let's all stand together.
We want to acknowledge God today. It's got a mind of its own. <laughs> it's like the clay in the Bible. It talks back to the clay worker. <laughs> Resists and has a mind of its own. I praise God for this uh, small and intimate convention. One thing I learned years ago is never to rave about the fact that there are no crowds present. And to take the people that came and skin them alive for the ones that didn't come. <laughs> Dr. Hira taught them that at Zion Bible Institute. My wife taught me. <laughs> so I've learned from Dr. Hero even. Uh, what we do is we work creatively with what's available, who's present. So I like it the way it is. I've had some of the most astounding meetings with a few people. And Jesus is here. And he's here with all his characteristics works. He, he saves the soul, he heals the body, he raises the dead, he drives out demons with his word. Uh, he can do all of his characteristic works, can't he? Praise God. And uh, this morning, <clears throat> we uh, are going to have a little Bible lesson. <clears throat> and I'm going to share some fragments with you uh, in the area of 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to... Uh, Teach the doctrine of God today from his own, his very own word. God, let me give you a definition of God. God is that being whose throne is justice, whose atmosphere is love, for whom all time is now, for whom all space is here, and his only inability is to sin. We're going to talk about God today, God's ways from God's word, and about his son, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is always hovering near, and Jesus is present this morning as the Logos, amen? He's present as the word, and the God we serve is a speaking God. Praise his wonderful name, and uh, today... Uh, we're going to teach some lessons from Saul and David. We're going to deal with uh, a time of transition from the old to the new. And uh, I'm going to look into uh, the words of chapter 16 and uh, some uh, a little bit back in chapter 15 and recapitulate a little, a little bit from chapter 8 on about Saul himself. Praise God. And uh, what I have this morning is fragments of broken bread, as John Wright Follett would say. Now, uh, in the transition from uh, an old spiritual order to a new spiritual order, or from Saul to David, and I, I would like to express that I don't have, or I fancy that I don't have any high-minded ideas in teaching about this. All I want to portray is the fact that when there is a ministry with which God is dissatisfied, he being God and being almighty and having an eternal purpose that never can break into or fall to the ground, he will then begin to work to bring into being a ministry that pleases him. Does he have the right to do that? Is that not a logical thing to do? Uh, perhaps I could read a scripture uh, pertinent to that from... Uh, first Samuel, a little farther back, which I think is in chapter number 2. I am tremendously and incurably fascinated with times of transition, and I believe we're in one at this present hour. In fact, Sister Adkins said it, and Brother Taylor said it today already. And I thank God for the liberating gospel statements that came to us last night. How many can thank God for that? Yeah. You see, it is my uh, opinion that there are some things you cannot do until you really get clear in your spirit and have a solid conversion. 
Our day it sees the phenomenon of widespread salvation without conversion. And uh, we must work towards solider conversions. And what I propose to do is preach the word of God. Hallelujah. Rest, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, uh, let me see here. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Second, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. This has to do with Samuel's coming into the world. And another uh, tense time of transition. And it tells us in second, uh, 1 Samuel, I'm sorry, it's 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12 concerning the sons of Eli, the high priest, who were the functional ministers of Israel at that hour. They were the chief functionaries of God's kingdom. And this is what the Bible says about them. This is the revelatory, penetrating, uh, authoritative, Holy Spirit interpretation. It says in 1 Samuel 2.12, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They knew not Yahweh. And that's his redemptive name. They did not know the Lord as their personal Savior. To paraphrase it. Now could those men rightly represent the kingdom of God? They could not rightly represent the kingdom of God, could they? And at that time, the Lord uh, worked in a hidden way to remove them from the scene and to bring in Samuel, who would glorify him. And uh, now let us uh, go back here to this uh, other place in 1 Samuel, chapter 16. I was looking through some old notebooks of mine this morning, and I saw a statement I had penciled... Uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago, at which time I wrote down that the juncture of the old and the new, or that is, during a time which we call a transitional bridge, there is a high state of agitation, something unexplainable in human terms, intense contention all the way down to the personal level. And in these times, it will, this particular a spiritual operation will reveal itself as an intense dissatisfaction. That's what we will see. Now, uh, let us just look into the Word of God here. Uh, I want to read uh, some uh, statements from chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. And uh, this is after the final uh, break between Samuel and Saul. And I'm going to look at verse 34, 35, and then 16, 1 of 1 Samuel. The Bible says, after this final meeting with Saul and Samuel, in which after Saul has confessed, in verse 24, I have sinned. I thank God for that propitiated God in heaven who isn't mad at us today as Brother Robin preached last night. I presume it is not everlastingly too late for anyone in this assembly room to repent and get right with God this morning and to make heaven your everlasting home to speak in a, a common mode of speech. How many are glad for that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have seen enthusiasms of the past perish. We have seen structures uh, fall to pieces. Amen. We have been turned, our, our hearts have been rent asunder as we have seen movements uh, deflected from God's eternal purpose. But all is not lost this morning. Hallelujah. I can still be accepted through the shed blood of the covenant. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. And I want to, I want to just say a, a, as a creation of a background that in this story, everything that happens, happens on covenant ground. Samuel is always keeping himself on covenant ground. You will never launch a mighty ministry on shaky ground. There's a lake up the road here about uh, 15 miles or 18 up on Pisica Road, up on the unpaved part, down the hill and in the valley. It's, it's a lake that has uh, three quarters died. It's a, a large flat valley which was once all lake and now the earth has come in and all lakes are dying lakes and this is a dying lake. And, if you walk down onto the shore of Sand Lake, you'll find it has a shoreline 
that is just resting on water, and if you jump up and down like this, the entire shore will ripple like water. It's not really solid ground. Brother Bill and I have walked out there together, I think, and caused that land to undulate. You couldn't launch anything on that kind of ground. You've got to get solid ground under your feet. You've got to get divine concrete under your feet before you can launch a solid ministry. I take it that's why many miracle ministries have failed in our generation. They did not have solid ground under their feet. Anybody hearing? Amen. Now where was I? Saul has confessed, I have sinned. And then after he has confessed, I have sinned, he still begs Samuel to worship with him again for the public effect, for the show of it, for the sake of the social element. And I do not take Samuel to be an utter hypocrite when he finally does turn and worship one last time with Saul. I believe I owe a social debt. Though I am not a very social person, and I resist the power of the social to a tremendous degree, I believe it's not God's will for me ultimately to be a solitary, wandering prophet, just only relating to myself, me and myself like rotating binary stars, me and my ministry. But I believe I owe a social debt to society, to the people, and that I have got to in some way be committed to a people. It's been very painful for me to come to this place and to be able to admit that and even to positively embrace it and, and see something positive and good in it. Hallelujah. And so I believe that most of the time we ought not to, like a, a wild man of the spirit, rend the social fabric. But I do see in, in Saul's behavior here that his kingdom is composed, it is woven of a tissue of lies. I believe the task of the present hour is to bring the truth out onto the stage. This is a very laborious travail to bring forth the truth and to let the truth begin to prevail. But the truth will set you free. Amen. And I have found out in my experience there's no such thing as attaining a final truth or a final position or, or, or a final status. I don't believe in any of that. That comes under the category of ontology. That's frozen and crystallized being. I believe John's Gospel where it says, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Amen. I believe Christianity is an everlastingly repeated decision you've got to make. And when you cease to, to continue to make that decision, you cease to be a live Christian. That's how I think. <laughs> and I'm not laboring to impose my truth on you. I'm just here opening the Bible and saying a few things and didn't plan to say that. But you can see that a problem is Saul's kingdom is composed of a tissue of lies. And our God says he is the what? He is the truth. So he is going to work to, to correct this problem. Praised be the name of our God. <clears throat> and so, giving you that little bit of background, and we will go back again before I get very far in verse 1 of chapter 16. It tells us in verse 34 of chapter 15, Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Uh, I feel like reading one more very bitter statement. And uh, I'm thinking of a New Testament statement of Paul. Let every man that thinketh that he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is no group on earth of perfectionists who don't need to worry about falling. Such a thing does not exist. I have found my salvation more severely challenged by the devil in the last six years than ever before in my younger days. I never thought I would face these kind of challenges and be shaken to the foundation. But I praise God, I believe all these things tend to shake us right down onto Jesus Christ the rock. Hallelujah. That humble place. Praise God. Here is a, a kind of a finality about Saul. Chapter 28 and verse number 6. 
<clears throat> he is facing a host of Philistines. Verse 5 says he is, he is very fearful. In chapter 28 and verse 6 of 1 Samuel says, When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by urim, nor by prophets. Can you imagine a man who has fallen into such a state that he can't dream anymore? It reminded me of the, the label Joseph's brothers put upon him as he approached him out in the field that day in Dothan. He said, Behold, this master dreamer cometh. Joseph's mastery was in the realms of dreams, the realm of dreams, the realm of the spirit, hallelujah. Dr. Cho of Korea has a church of 450,000 now. I don't understand much about that, but I do know that when it all began, he decided to dream himself a church of 300. He said he dreamed it, hallelujah. Isn't it sad when a man passes over a line uh, on the other side of which there is no more dreaming. God doesn't speak to him by dreams anymore, uh, neither by Urim nor by prophets. No prophet ever comes to see him anymore. There is nothing more. For with Saul, God has fallen silent. What a terrible state that is when you have had the oil poured upon your body by the prophet and the Holy Ghost has come upon you, turned you into another man, you have joined a company of whirling dervish prophets and prophesied in their midst. And you have known that whole dimension of things, that, that excitation of divine life and inspiration and now the day has come when all of that category of existence is sealed off to you and you are, you, you are, you are just sunk in the abyss of your own self, in your own sinfulness. How glad and happy I am that I still dream, and God speaks to me by dreams. Hallelujah. Jesus. Blessed be God that I am not consigned to this kind of oblivion. That, that dramatic statement seized upon me. The Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by urim, nor by prophets. So that's all background to uh, what we are dealing with here in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. <coughs> and the Lord, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. I began to be gripped by verse number one in the first statement some time ago in my life, where I see that one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, in fact, Samuel was really the beginning of what we call prophets and prophetism. They had it in a random fashion previous to this. They had great men like Moses. They had various nameless prophets, but as far as an existence of a prophetic order in Israel, that is an order that produced the national preachers. And there's all kind of confusion about the prophetic prophets and prophetism. Samuel is the beginning, and that's not hard to demonstrate. I'm not going to bother trying to demonstrate. But he embodied in his person the essence of all the prophets who would preach to Israel from himself down to Malachi. And he set up schools of the prophets that produced the prophets and probably 80 or 90 percent of all the preachers to Israel come out of his schools. The Bible does not charge him with fault or sin, really. He is an exemplary character. He is stainless. His ministry is, is astounding. The, the miracles of God that came through it. 
And I, I, I would greatly magnify Samuel in our eyes. And yet here I see the world's greatest prophet thinking different thoughts from the mind of God. God has performed a sharp point action of repentance. He has repented from making Saul king over Israel. Verse number 35 of chapter 15 says, And into chapter 16, Samuel is carrying his days of mourning over Saul. I have no doubt wasted quite a bit of time in my last 30 years grieving over movements. I really got focused in that when I got into the Pentecostal and saw it withering, saw the glory lifting, and saw the knowledge of the anointing perishing from the movement, and so I began to grieve and travail and fast and pray. Then I was in that great movement we call the, the deliverance movement with the gigantic tents and uh, 25 men of power were shaking the world and I saw that movement uh, crumble and uh, I went into an unusual state of grieving and sorrow over that. Then I entered into the latter rain movement, the new visitation and, and saw that founder for one reason or another which I have analyzed by historical studies and then the sonship movement and grieved and agonized and travailed. But I thank God there's something extant today that we can rejoice about it. It is the sacrifice on Calvary which has not failed. Hallelujah. It is the purpose of God that has not failed. It is the word of God that has not failed. Hallelujah. It is the kingdom of God that has not failed. Blessed be God. It is the Holy Ghost who has not been withdrawn from the earth. Glory be to his matchless name. It is my personal anointing which according to John, John's gospel and epistle, instead of being withdrawn at the slightest error on my part, it has rather remained and abided with me. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. He calls it the anointing that abideth. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. How many can praise God today? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be his wonderful Jesus. name. Amen. 1946, I believe, 45. Velmer Gardner was holding a crusade for Gordon Lindsay. He was pastoring in the Assemblies of God up in Oregon. Velmer Gardner and Lindsay were both marvelous men of God. How many know there are men of God in the world? There are women of God in the world. There's a people of God in the world. Why, another time, the greatest prophet said to God, the, the whole people of God are extinguished, and I'm the last one. Elijah said that. He was a prophet. Again, he was deceived or deluded or something. He said, now, God, the most efficient way to bring peace is just kill me and get me out of the earth. And they'll have it, all, the whole thing. There'll be solidarity, homogeneity. And then it'll all be the devil's kingdom, and, and I'll be gone, and we'll all be up there, and they'll all be down there. <laughs> and so God, see, sometimes we go out of our minds. We take what I call Adamic fits. We take these violent, raging fits of naturalistic thinking, rationalism, uh, building and construction a future out of the broken data of the past, <laughs> which only leaves out the ingredient of divine intervention. Amen. <laughs> So God just took his prophet and sort of petted him and uh, put a sleep up on him, laid him down there, sent down an angel chef and baked him bread and <laughs> fed him twice. <laughs> I said twice. That was my original Anglo-Saxon dialect. Once in a while I use a word of it. And after Elijah was regenerated and was sort of Making a comeback, God said, now i got more work for you to do. And besides, I have 7,000, I have a remnant of 7,000 stainless souls who are not defiled by Baal worship. <laughs> God, lead me to your remnant. <laughs> hallelujah. Thank you, ah, hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah in this place. Hallelujah. <laughs> when I left Detroit, I went there to leap into the great latter rain mainstream of glory <laughs> and I found it I found it like the West Canada over here when you canoe they open the gate up at Hinkley they let out a head of water and you get your canoe up there toward Trenton High Falls and after a while this big pile of water comes by you it's called a head of water and that's so canoeists can go down the West Canada and uh, it goes by you and let it go one hour then you put your canoe on and you ride all the way down to Herkimer if that's the way you're going to do it well, when I got to Detroit, I found the head of water of the Great Latter Rain had 
gone down past me a seven or eight or nine or ten years before. <laughs> and you had to bump your way down on the rocks. <laughs> I want to tell you, I'm not disappointed. I'm not disappointed. But Velmer Gardner was uh, at Gordon Lindsay's when the last of the great old-time healers died. Amy McPherson died. Mrs. Whitterworth had died in perhaps the late 20s. Uh, Martha Wing Robinson died. Uh, uh, Amy died. Smith Wigglesworth died. John Graham Lake died. All of the mighty uh, E.W. Kenyon died. They all died. <clears throat> Velmer Gardner is the man that was the chief fundraiser for All Rebels University. Saw the miracles of God in the area of finance, I mean authentic miracles. God made him a millionaire by the operation of this prophetic gift, just like that, by grace. And Velmer Gardner said, when I heard about the death of the last servant of God, he said, I went down to the basement of the church and I prostrated myself on the concrete and I lay there for hours and he said, I wept. And he said, I said to God, oh God, Wigglesworth is dead. Price is dead. McPherson is dead. Charles Price, the eloquent Pentecostal orator, was dead now. The most powerful Pentecostal preacher on the face of the earth. And Gardner said to God, God, these mighty servants are dead. Now who's going to heal the sick? Who will be able to go to now that they're all dead? And he lay there for hours and he wept and his soul almost dissolved in his body. And he said, after hours, the fire of God began to burn upon him. And God says, yes, it is true. Uh, Price is dead. McPherson is dead. Wigglesworth is dead. But the God of Price still lives. The God of McPherson still lives. The God of Wigglesworth still lives. And if you will pay the price as they paid the price, I will do miracles through you as I did through them. Blessed be God. Amen. Hallelujah. So here we are de dealing with a new generation creatively that we might... Uh, by the preaching of the word, generate a faith that will explode. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. How many are excited with these possibilities? Yes. I was uh, thrilled when Sister Lorene said this morning, I'm excited about God because in this chapter 16, David is going to have the oil poured on him. He's going to receive the Holy Spirit, it says in the text, and he is going to become excited. Hallelujah. He is going to experience the excitation of psychic faculties by what we call the anointing, hallelujah. Blessed be God. And you notice how at the burning bush. And where, who was that other character they preached about last week? Uh, take your shoe. Oh yes, Moses, take your shoes off. And to Joshua, take your shoe off. You see, God came down to offer those men the work shoes of deity, which are the gifts of the Spirit. And when you have the gifts of the Spirit, you begin to do the works of God. Hallelujah. How many are desirous and open yes. Amen. to that sort of thing? Being yes, used Lord. of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Praise name of the Lord. God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 So the Lord says, How long to Samuel wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. Amen. First of all, we find the prophet and the Lord with their thinking not synchronized. You know, there is a, a, a powerful theological concept called the sovereignty of God. And there is another one called the free moral agency of man. And I would like to impress upon us this morning the folly of ever making the assumption we know what the sovereign God has in mind. I believe we must make the discovery of the mind of God. The discovery of the mind of God is the sine qua non for any future fruitful action. It is the basic element. It is that without which there is nothing. We must discover the mind and thinking of God on any subject before there can be fruitful action. Now, let me share a few scriptures with you. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, knew something about this matter, and he told us so in the New Testament Gospel Scriptures. 
<clears throat> Could we turn together to John's Gospel, chapter number 5? And verse number 19 and 20 and 30. John chapter 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing out from himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what, whatsoever, for whatever things he doeth, these also doeth the Son in the same manner. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Verse 30 says, I can of mine own self do nothing. This is Jesus speaking. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father who hath sent me. Praise be his wonderful name. Uh, let me share another choice utterance of Jesus with you, which I will find in John's Gospel. Uh, I think there's one in chapter number 7. I have several here. John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 16, 17, and 18. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man wills to do God's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Verse 18 is an excellent criterion for the ministry. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Isn't that a marvelous standard for the ministry? You see, what the world needs is a generation of preachers who will preach Christ. There must be a, a revival of the preaching of Christ and, and evangelical purity. And also, I could say, in prophetic power. Now, I have another scripture here in John, uh, which is found in chapter number 16. Several. Little passage here. A little passage in John. <clears throat> Let me read to you John chapter 16, verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. Jesus tells us, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Nevertheless, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak out from himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Praise God. How many can praise God for those marvelous uh, utterances from the word of God? Uh, St. Paul had a revelation and a standard he adhered to, that, which is very similar. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. After, at the end of a most marvelous passage, one of my favorite New Testament passages, chapter 2, at the end of that, in 1 Corinthians... Paul asks us, For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Verse 16. Who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. I thank and praise God for the potential mind of Christ in the believer. Yes. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so... Oh, we notice in this biblical picture in chapter 16, verse 1 of 1 Samuel, we notice that uh, everything is stuck, as it were. King Saul is, as the poet said, stuck on the flypaper of the people. He is stuck with their carnal will and their carnal intentions, and he has become an instrument uh, of the carnal corporate will of Israel. The prophet says... Uh, 
In verse number two, when God tells him to take his horn of oil and go, he says, how can I go? If Saul here, he will kill me, you see. So the mighty prophet Samuel, he feels stuck. He feels that, uh, that there is an impassable barrier confronting him. I am mightily fascinated with historical debacles or impasses or those times when everything seems to have assumed a, a crystalline structure that will not yield to anything. When all of the human actors involved are bound, as it were. I'm very fascinated with all of that. And we're going to make a discussion relative to that out of this verse here. Praise be the name of our God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now, in, verse, in, in chapter 16, in this whole historical period, in, in verse number 2, at this particular time, uh, there is a historical failure of God's chosen instrument, which is Saul and his... Uh, his machinery, his kingdom, and his court. Now, Saul has failed, and, and, and Israel's machinery is temporarily frozen up. Everything is tight. Everything is, is unmovable. It's like a frozen machine that's rested fast. And even the mighty Samuel says, I, I, my, limita my, my actions are limited, Lord, because if I try to go and pour oil on somebody else, Saul here, and they go kill me. Now, here is a principle. The failure of God's chosen instrument does not place God in a state of moral paralysis. You might paralyze all the human actors. The kingdom might seem to be frozen. There may seem to be an impassable barrier, but God himself is not limited. Hallelujah. How many can praise? If sovereignty means anything, it means that God is free to act, always free to act. Hallelujah. Blessed be his wonderful name. I am fascinated with the imagery in a certain chapter that's in this portion, it's, it's in this uh, historical period of time. I believe it's the portion found, let me see now, I have a portion of scripture marked out here uh, in uh, 2 Samuel, I believe it is, yes, I'm sorry, it's 1 Kings. First Kings. First Kings, chapter three. <clears throat> First Kings, chapter three. And in this passage, it's it's uh, has to do with Solomon's kingship. Solomon has prayed for basically wisdom. Uh, it call, it's called in the text here, an understanding heart. Uh, I think the Hebrew means there, a hearing heart. Other parts of the Bible we read about the, the, the exceeding value of having a hearing ear. How many in this uh, convention, in this meeting, want to have a hearing ear? Amen. And let us beware, lest we feel finished, perfected, or... As, as though we have arrived at something. We have arrived at nothing. We're, we're a people in a state of dynamic movement from the past to the, uh, the, past to the future. Yeah. I don't feel that I've attained anything, but I am actively working upon this whole concept of, have, of having a hearing heart or a hearing ear. And Solomon asked for that, and the Bible said that pleased the Lord. And then right soon after that, there was presented a... A, 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 a naughty problem, a, a problem with a Gordian knot, a, an insoluble problem. Two harlots came who had two babies, and one got suffocated, and then they contended, and both said, the living child belonged to me. And they stood before King Solomon. Both women, with full conviction, says, the living baby is mine, and the dead baby is hers. And Solomon says, in verse 24, it says, and the king said, hallelujah, the king said, how many know God is king in Zion? Amen. Hallelujah. And he reigneth and he's sovereign and he's free to act Amen. in spite of the mess that earthly movements find themselves in. The king said, bring me a sword. 
Hello, and cut the baby in two. I, I am completely taken up with this sword-like kind of wisdom. This, this, this short. See, the Lord's up above all that. He's not mired in our situation. It says, and the Lord said. Take a heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. God didn't have to contract himself and with a great effort get out a word that would overcome this countervailing situation. <laughs> he just said, the Lord said, take a heifer, Samuel. I, I like to uh, meditate on comical, perhaps even comical ways the word of the Lord came in a situation. Holy Ann Preston, the wonderful Irish saint up in Toronto, Ontario, that heard from God as few people in all history did. She had a bad ankle sprain one winter when it was 20, 30, and 40 below zero. The doctor said, Diane, you've got to have fresh milk and eggs to heal that ankle up. And the cold weather had made all the chickens quit laying. It does that. Dry weather does it. Cold weather does it. Sent a servant all around the Toronto environs to get fresh eggs, and it couldn't be had. The chickens were not laying. It was 20, 30, and 40 below zero. So they sent Anne home, and there was nothing to be done. And so it was the next day, or maybe that evening, uh, she heard a knock on the door, a little pecking kind of a knock, and opened the door, and there was a hen who had been pecking on her door. And the hen walked up the stairs to the head of the stairs. It was a farmhouse with a door and a stairs. And the hen walked right up the stairs, sat at the top, and laid an egg. And then she walked down the stairs and she left. And she came every day for 21 days, pecked on the door and laid an egg <laughs> at the top of the stairs. I don't know why she went up there to lay the egg. This is actual history. And she was renowned among Methodist pastors. They counseled with her. She was a marvelous miracle worker of the 19th century and died right around 1900. And she was to one day to school one day in her life, and they sent her home telling her she was hopeless. And I just met somebody else who went to school one half day in her life who was mightily used of God. I forget who that was now. So Anne went up, hobbled up the stairs with her two hands and her one good leg, and she looked at the egg, and she was puzzled about how to get the egg downstairs. So she said, Father, how do I get the egg downstairs? And God says, put it in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like that reality, that, that realness, that, that practicalness, that, that marvelous usableness of the Word of God. It's just as real as uh, whole wheat flour or butter or anything else. It's an ingredient. It'll make a good life if you get the Word of the Lord <laughs> mixed up in your, your experience. Praise the name of the Lord. <laughs> and so I want you to notice that though Saul is bound and his whole kingdom, his machinery is bound and it's even binding the great prophet, God has been uh, stealthily uh, sneaking into the situation behind the scenes and he has already uh, looked over David, the son of Jesse, and he says, I have provided me, I have already provided me a king among his sons. So that there is a principle when the old thing is becoming decrepit and passing away, the new is already in a state of formation. Hallelujah. Blessed yes, be God. You can see the thing that begets despair. Yes. But if you could see God through God's eye, you would see the thing that begets hope. Hallelujah. And faith. Glory be to Amen. God. Pardon me for overloading the sound system here for a moment. My apologies, Roberta. <laughs> Forget myself. This is the mark the Pentecostals made on me years ago. <laughs> Does need to be disciplined, let us remember. <laughs> All the fathers and mothers agreed. Philette, Martha Wing, Philip Whittingham, am I telling the truth, Brother Hoyer, that they all agree we must be disciplined in the spirit. Amen. Let's all say amen now. Amen. amen. <laughs> We're just agreeing with the word of God, not with me, you see. Sometimes I say I repudiate my thinking and I affirm the word of God. <laughs> And I'd like to repudiate my feelings and affirm the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I don't want to be me. <laughs> I pity you. Any of you are willing to remain you, I pity you. <laughs> we learned how, learned how to divest ourselves, uh, as Millie Bertelli used to, our grubby little selves. <laughs> Get them into the trash bin of history as quick as you can and begin to live Jesus' life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it is characterized by freedom. Look. Paul has it crystallized in the New Testament in unforgettable form. He says the word of God is not bound. 
It's demonstrated. And impossible. What are you going to do, Lord? <laughs> You're bound just like us, aren't you? Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> and the Lord said. <laughs> and the Lord said. And the sword cut, hallelujah. And a pathway was made. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. About the 30 heads the devil weaves about us. Oh, the sword flash. Glory be to God. It's been divided asunder. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus says, I am the way. Glory be to God. I don't know. Right, uh, I thought I was just going to teach some low-key principles out of... Thank you, Jesus. I operate in a dual fashion. The Word of God is not bound, Paul said. God the Father stood at the verge of nothingness on the creation day. <laughs> Spoke a word out to absolute nothingness. And begot a creation. Yes. Did not have a fundraising drive to do it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And then create part of it like the stars and the sons of God. And then take up an offering to do the rest. No. <laughs> he did it by grace. Through faith. That worketh by love. Which is inspired by hope. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. I see two dynamic movements in verse 1. I see a movement of a word. <laughs> and I see a movement of a horn of oil. <laughs> hey. Praise God. <laughs> God spoke to me years ago and he said, In any situation, keep your eye on the horn of oil. <laughs> see, the Holy Ghost is not bound. Listen. We are confronted in New Covenant grandeur and glory and expansiveness. We are confronted not with the choice between good and evil at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, which is where most of humanity are yet. They're still standing before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil confronted by a, a, a choice between good and evil. I am confronted before the tree of life, which is the cross of Christ with a choice to become creative. God reveals himself in this tremendous concept that has been working my mind and spirit and soul for the last a number of years. God is always freely creative. I have to keep reminding myself God that I serve is not bound by the parameters of my mental vision. Jesus Christ is the way. He is not only the way into salvation, putting it in a nutshell, he is all, also the way out of impossible situations. And where there is no way, naturally speaking, that you can perceive uh, rationally or by ocular observation or by feeling and groping your way or even by human intuition where you sense there is no way at all Jesus Christ is the way where there is no way yeah. hallelujah hallelujah praise his wonderful name <clears throat> and so for free moral agents especially the sovereign God, or I could say the creative or creator God. Present disintegration may serve as a platform for positive action. <clears throat> you know, this tension, there's a terrible tension in this part of the scriptures. You know, I preached in this scripture for years and years and years, and I heard a lot of Laterine and Sonship Men, and I'm, this is probably, probably Brother Roy Jacobson's favorite passage of Scripture. I heard him, I don't know how many times on this, three times at least, and even discussed it with him. And all of a sudden, last February, I was sitting up in Watertown in Pastor Larkin's spare bedroom. All of a sudden, something came over me, and I felt compelled to what, do what I hate to do, and that's right. And all of a sudden, I, it was as though God took and peeled a layer of the onion skin off, and I saw a whole new reality in this chapter.
This is only the third time I'm dealing with these matters with, from this new viewpoint. First time it was in a teaching class, it was kind of like low-key teaching and not all that much penetration. Now this is the third time and I'm seeing more and more. This is opening up like a, like a marvelous flower to me. It's, it's like a developing universe of, 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 of wisdom and knowledge as it were. But there's a tension, there's a terrible tension here. What is the tension? It is a fact that Samuel has poured oil on two men at the same historical period. He has poured the oil of a king on Saul, and he's poured the oil of a king on David, and now there is a tension. Let me just read a, a, a definitive statement out of the Word of God, which I think would be in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel. Just You may turn to it. It's probably good to have our Bibles turning. It's probably good discipline. And, Good to be in the Word of God, isn't it? Isn't it good to spend this hour in the Word of God? Yes. Isn't it good to be yes. in the Bible, in, in old Israel, in this marvelous world where God was intervening? Amen. I tell you, if you ever wanted to bless me and give me the ultimate gift, just let me see God intervene in something. I love to see God intervene. How many love to see the intervening hand of God? Yes. Oh, hallelujah! Glory. I feel the power and the substance of faith here today. Hallelujah. And you may be healed here today by Christ the Healer. Amen. Amen. I know I'm not all that refined. I have a high aesthetic sense of what it is to be refined. And it's very embarrassing to have this ministry, I'll tell you. It's very embarrassing. Very embarrassing. And originally I didn't want it, and God and I wrestled six years before I would say yes. <laughs> And by the end of the six years, I was in the upstairs attic of the house of a mighty man of God, one of the mightiest preachers and miracle men of this world. And I thought, I want to end this agony of this gnawing conviction that I'm called to preach the Word of God. My mother had seen it already uh, 30 years ago or 32 in a dream, and she was afraid to tell me because of the way I am. I'm reactionary. So my own mother was afraid to tell me. I praise God for my mother. Hallelujah. We need to love and honor our mothers, don't we? Amen. I read this by a great brain. <laughs> I read this by a great brain. It is impossible to treat a woman too well. <laughs> That's not in the Bible, but it almost is. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. So I thought, well... I've probably been deluded, like a lot of young people, you know, an Adamic flash has been upon me. And I got the opinion that I'm supposed to be among these mighty men that are moving people with their persuasive power. and Everything was just going wrong in my life for a period of years. It seemed like structures were falling and nothing was rising. So I'll just take this mighty man of God. I got a corner up here on the fourth floor. He can't get away from me. I'll just look him in the eyeball and I said, Brother so-and-so, do you believe I am called to preach? And I was probably two-thirds hoping for a, a no and maybe one-third expecting a yes. You know, I was something, I was divided up in an uneven way inside. And This man is very dramatic. He's Scotch, English, and Irish, and those Celtic dramatic forces have just come to their maximum in him. And So I looked him in the eye and I said, Brother so-and-so, do you believe I am called to preach? And he said, Unquestionably. <laughs> and uh, I was... <clears throat> anyway, here's our statement in 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse number 1. It says, Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger. That's the spiritual house. The house of the pneumatikoi. Spiritual ones. <laughs> Permit me to use a few esoteric terms, okay? And the house of Saul. That's the house of the sukikoi. The psychic or the, or the natural or the sensual ones. The men of the covenant who ought to be spiritual, but they have the same mind, and they live just as though they were natural, unregenerate men. They know better, they ought to know better, they ought to do better, but they have just fallen to a, 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 a low-life pattern, and the Bible says Saul's house waxed weaker and weaker. 
I believe something like that process is surreptitiously taking place in these days. <clears throat> now, I'm going to make what would be considered a fairly bold interpretative statement. I believe the spirit of David requires the creative tension that Saul's house provides him to become all that he can become in God. We need this, brother and sister. We have needed these dealings. We have needed this back pressure. We have needed our apple cart upset. We have needed this chastisement. We have needed to be paddled by our Heavenly Father lots and lots of times. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 I have always been hindered. I've always been suppressed. I've always had negative things pressing against me. I believe God has appointed it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, Praise the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And so God, we're back in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel again. <clears throat> and I believe God is speaking to me to bring this to a more rapid close. I'm not going to go on and on ex expounding on every verse. I'm just going to leave you with some fragments, but they're not bad fragments in my opinion. Hallelujah. And God gives the uh, instructions and says, Call David's father, Jesse, to the sacrifice. And Jesse's name is interesting in Hebrew. It means existing or extant. My friend, I not only believe that the seeds of destruction are in the charismatic movement. The all movements have contained the seeds of their own destruction. That was one of Walter Butler's favorite and oft-repeated principles. I not only believe that the seeds of destruction are present, I also believe that the creative seeds of a new day are present. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. And so, I'm just going to... Uh, sort of squeeze the accordion together and, and compress this all. I want you to notice, I want you to notice, and this is, a, I believe, a very good principle and, and a good way of bringing this out. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, especially verse 1 and the verses that follow, as soon as the earthly mind of God's vessel, that's Samuel, the prophet, as soon as the earthly mind of the prophet faithfully reflects the content of the heavenly mind of the Lord, things begin to happen. Oh, for the power and the grace to think his thought, to embody his thought, to grasp his thought, which is what I call an adequate thought or an adequate concept. That, that, uh, that idea of which Victor Hugo spoke, stronger than an army, is an idea when its time has come. Hallelujah. How many know God knows just what moment to cast a, a creative idea into the stream of the human race and to begin to move people for Jesus and for his kingdom and for salvation and for God's glory? Hallelujah. Bless his wonderful name. <clears throat> Samuel's conscious positive obedience pulls the kingdom bulldozer into gear. <laughs> An irresistible purpose has been set afoot in the earth. It's going to anoint a king, hallelujah. And that's no small thing. Can you say amen? amen? Someone who will rule and reign out from the heart of God. Praise the wonderful name of God. Now, then we have the frustration of Samuel working his way through the seven sons of Jesse and the spirit won't witness to any of it. And God said, I haven't chosen these. And then in comes the eighth one called David. Now, there's something I want to bring out here that's kind of a nice point. Sometimes in hyper-spiritual thinking, we are given the idea that the thing we desire is always the attractive thing, and the thing that God imposes on us as his will is unattractive, ugly, repellent. But as a mighty, agapetic discipline, we'll take it and live with it, you know. God will make me marry a woman I don't really love or even like. God will make me marry a man that's repulsive and a beast, and he'll beat me, and that'll be my way of being made, made spiritual. No. It says in verse 12 of 1 Samuel 16, Jesse sent and brought him in, David. Now David was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance and handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where do I have my principle here? 
When's God, when God's will or God's choice is finally manifest, it will not be disappointing. Amen. You will like it. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Also, do you notice how at the end of a See, we started in around chapter 15, and we go through chapter 16. There's a kind of a developmental curve, divine instigation, the curve of development, and then at the end, at the, at the end of the dealing, in verse number 12 or verse number 13, the dealing ends with a period. God has successfully consummated an intermediary phase of his workings in the earth. David is in, the oil is on him, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord has come upon him in chapter, in verse 13. You see, the kingdom is in gear. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And so you can see David emerging against the stress and the resistance of a, of a, of a uh, corrupt order. And, and it's making him strong as he emerges. I wonder if I might <clears throat> uh, read a poem that came back to my memory. It's called, When Heaven Wants a Man. It's by Angela Morgan and it's been modified from its original form. When Heaven, how many believe Heaven Wants a Man? <laughs> Praise God. Brother Taylor, I'm right where I was 30 years ago. God is saying, Heaven Wants a Man. <laughs> See, Goliath is out screaming at a bell, send me a man. And, and God in heaven is saying, I want a man. Everybody wants a man. <laughs> Let me read one classic scripture just before I read that. Ezekiel chapter 22. It's the classic expression. 2230 of Ezekiel. God says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I take it from the Bible. There are generations when God finds a man and times when he doesn't find a man. And of course, I'm not leaving the ladies out. I'm not a misogynist. I, I see that the kingdom has a tremendous place for God's, the woman of God. And this poem is called, When Heaven Wants a Man. When heaven wants to take a man and shake a man and wake a man, when heaven wants to make a man to do the future's will, with what cunning it prepares him, how it goads and never spares him. How it often disappoints whom it sacredly anoints. With what wisdom it will hide him, though never minding what betide him. Though his genius saw was slighting and his pride may not forget. Bids him struggle harder yet. Makes him lonely so that only God's high messages shall reach him. So that it may surely teach him what the God had carefully planned. Though he may not understand, gives him passions to command. How remorselessly it spurs him, with terrific ardor stirs him, when it poignantly prefers him. When heaven wants to name a man, and fame a man, and tame a man, when heaven wants to shame a man to do his heavenly best, then it tries the highest test that its reckoning may bring when it wants a god or king. How it reigns him and restrains him, so his body scarce contains him. While it fires him and inspires him, keeps him yearning, ever burning for a tantalizing goal, lures and lacerates his soul, sets a challenge for his spirit, draws it higher when he's near it, makes a jungle that he clear it, makes a desert that he fear it, and subdue it if he can, so doth heaven make a man. Heaven's plan is wondrous kind, could we understand its mind? Fools are they who call it blind, when his feet are torn and bleeding, Yet his spirit mounts unheeding, all his higher powers speeding, blazing newer paths and fine. When the force that is divine leaps to challenge every failure, and his ardor still is sweet, keeps the lamps of hope still burning in the presence of defeat. Lo the crisis, lo the shout that must call the leader out. When the people need salvation, he doth come to lead the nation. Then doth heaven show its plan when at last it's found. A man. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to God. Stand with me, please, my friends. <clears throat> Heaven has found its man. His name is Jesus. Yes. He's there bodily in heaven. Hallelujah. 
Glory be to God. Praise His wonderful name. I feel the power of consecration working in here now. I feel that ancient spirit that called David out. Hallelujah. I wonder if any of you would like to, to, to make a public step of faith and walk right up here to stand in this space up front. Would you, would you like to do that? Is there anyone who, who feels the consecrating power of the kingdom working within? And this is foolish, I know, and that's why I hardly ever do it. But sometimes I get overcome. Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's all come and stand here in, in, in consecration Hallelujah. to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. <coughs> Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh God. Blessed be the name of our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be thy name. Let's just talk to God one to one. Let's just tell him. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless thy holy name, O Lord. Oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory be to thy name. Glory be to thy name. <clears throat> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory be to thy wonderful name. Oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord's name. Hallelujah. Lord, we feel yearnings in our hearts, stirrings in our hearts, desirings in our spiritual and inward man for this biblical reality. And Lord, we know and we are persuaded there's nothing in this world worthwhile dedicating ourselves to but Christ, his gospel, and his kingdom. So, Lord, we perform this symbolic action, take this step, pray these prayers today, limited and faulty and fragmentary as they may be. Pray that you, by your grace, will add to us what is lacking. Forgive us all of our sins and our errors and our shortcomings on the ground of the shed blood of the covenant. But our mind and our will is to consecrate and reconsecrate to you, Lord Jesus, you the King, the Savior, the very wisdom of God. Hallelujah. Praise be thy mighty name. Praise be thy mighty name, O Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to thy name. Thy grace is sufficient for us. For thy strength is made perfect in weakness. Hallelujah. Thou art the all-sufficient answer, the solution, the life, the satisfaction. Praise thy name. Praise be thy name. Praise be thy name. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. I would like to sing something, and, but I can't really do it, and I need Sister Joan's help. If she would just come most graciously to this, this place, and Brother Bill, and Brother William, and you can sing that lovely expression, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. Yes. Would you help me with that, Joan? Praise the Lord. We're going to praise and worship Jesus Amen. to seal the hot wax yes, of this moment. Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah.
Interesting song now. Our mood is one of both reverence and vigorous aggressiveness. Can you say amen? Yes. I want to sing it as the time to take the kingdom. How did David take the kingdom? By receiving the oil. Oh God. <laughs> it is the one on whom oh, the oil Jesus. is poured that takes Hallelujah. the kingdom. It's not arbitrary, it's not arrogance, which means grabbing what isn't yours. When he pours the oil, the kingdom is yours. Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Simeon got to cradle Jesus' baby in his arms. He held the whole kingdom. Let's sing it. It is the time to take the kingdom. It is the time to take the kingdom. Rise up, be strong.
the God we serve puts concrete realities into our hands. He puts effective instrumentalities into our hands, things that work. And I feel like exhorting us to hold fast to those things we have received as our Brother Hall dismisses us today. Thank you, Father. Lord, it's been so good to be here. Amen. Father, your presence is real. And I appreciate you so much. Amen. Father, I feel that appreciation in every heart that's here. Amen. Thank you for the anointed word. Yes, Lord. For the timely word. Yes. And for the instruction and the understanding of the word. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each one that has come. And we pray that they will go away from this place changed. Lord, not the same as they came in the service today, but go away greater, stronger, more meek and humble in the presence of God. Father, able to hear your voice. And now, Father, we thank you. And we dismiss in Jesus' holy name. Yes. Under the blood of Jesus, we all go in thy grace. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Thank <laughs> <laughs>